Good afternoon and welcome to this Aspen webinar on fluoroscopic anatomy for the uh, pain physician. This is a um, teaching tool that is a product of the Aspen Committee on Fellows and Resident Education. And all of tonight's participants are part of this uh, respective committee for Aspen. Uh, my name is Dr. Timothy Lubinow. I am an anesthesiologist and professor of anesthesiology at Rush University Medical Center, where I serve as program director for the Pain Medicine Fellowship training program. Joining me is Dr. Mansoor Aman. He is a private practice hospital-based anesthesiologist in Oshkosh, and he has really been the uh, figurehead and spearheading uh, tonight's effort. Joining him will be Dr. Ryan Kuda, who is a anesthesiologist and a current fellow at Rush University, uh, my training program, as well as Dr. Jason Esla, who is an anesthesiology resident at Baylor University in Houston, Texas. I would ask everybody to mute their particular um, laptops for the majority of the presentation and then forward questions through the chat box <clears throat> to Lakin, and then we'll take questions at the conclusion of the webinar. And with that, I wish to turn this over to Dr. Aman. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your evenings to join us today. Uh, and thank you for the introduction, Dr. Lubinow. I'm just going to take a minute and uh, set the stage as far as expectations and what we're going to be covering this evening. Um, next slide, please. So really, the objectives of tonight is to understand uh, basic radiation safety, understand normal fluoroscopic anatomy, as well as appreciate the views that are commonly utilized for interventional pain procedures, where the targets are located that we're uh, commonly treating, as well as optimal needle placement. We'll also, at the very end, go over some common pathology that we see on x-ray um, that is very crucial to our day-to-day -day practice. Next slide, please. I'll give it up to Jason. Hello, so uh, talking about radiation when it comes to uh, fluoroscopy, it's first to remember or recognize that, you know, as time goes on, we're getting more and more advanced uh, procedures going. And uh, because of that, there's gonna be a lot more radiation exposure and a lot more fluoroscopy that's needed. And uh, it's important to recognize what uh, is the current understanding and uh, knowledge when it comes to uh, the radiation dangers and when it comes to the safety and what you can do to prevent or minimize your exposure. And this, this study here was a survey uh, sent out by uh, Dr. Provanzo, who's a, who's a chronic pain doc, uh, and he pretty much sent it out uh, 49 questions to a bunch of pain docs that, through all the main organizations, and it, uh, basically covering questions about all the different safety precautions you can take and different uh, concepts about radiation and how you can how you're exposed and how much you're exposed to, and it found that uh, surprisingly. A over 90% were concerned about it uh, as far as the physicians who answered the survey, but you know, less than almost 60% said they had any formal training about uh, radiation safety, and uh, less than 20% said that they followed at least 80% of the recommendations that we're going to go over. Um, uh, next slide. So, just some basics of the C arm. Uh, it's it's it comes from the radiation source is the bottom where the x-ray tube the tube is or the, or the source and that's where the radiation is emitted from it goes straight through the table the patient from an ap uh, view all the way through uh, to the ii the image uh, intensifier that basically makes it a higher quality image and then you see it on the monitor uh, you can obviously do it laterally you can do it ap you can also do it uh, ask for a subflatter at. And it's important to remember that traditionally when asking to do stuff or caught at uh, with the tech, it's it's traditionally referring to the, the tube positioning going one way or the other. Uh, but generally as the uh, proceduralist, you're thinking of the II usually. So it's just important to recognize that difference. Uh, and lastly, you can actually see that there's, we're going to talk about this in a second, but the, the linear kilometer and the iris kilometer that actually change the volume of radiation that's being uh, exposed. Uh, and we'll mention that as we go on as well and how that's important for reducing radiation exposure. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is just kind of the image on the right is kind of just outlining what it kind of looks like and where the radiation is coming from that you're being exposed to when you're uh, in these rooms doing these procedures. You can have leakage from the, the tube itself, the source, uh, as well as just uh, a scattered rays coming from the patient, the table, everything that's being sent out directly through. 
Uh, and then it's the, basically the principle that is followed that reduces the amount of radiation exposure you have is ALARA as low as reasonably ach achievable. And that's pretty much talking about time, distance, and shielding. Uh, and there's multiple other organizations that kind of provide guidelines based on studies that we'll see shortly as well. Uh, but basically looking at time, just going through the bullet points, time being uh, the amount of actual duration because uh, x-ray uh, and radiation is cumulative so to decrease and take purposeful images and not just get into this routine of taking images because you can and you just you know you inch something a little further and you want to just check it instead of thinking about do I need it now or do I or can I do a different mode that I'll talk about in the fourth bullet point um, and then looking at distance uh, you need, it's important to recognize that the distance matters a lot when it comes to how much you're being exposed to radiation, how far you are from the source and from the beam that's being projected uh, to the II through the patient. And basically every time you double your distance from the source, you're uh, dividing your exposure by four. So every time you double your distance, four times less radiation exposure. So, you know, utilize that how you can and when you can. Um, and when it comes to shielding, this is very important as well. And uh, this is what's probably utilized the most already. But when it comes to interventional cardiologists and interventional radiologists, they actually have much more uh, information on this and much more studies that I looked into. And when it comes to the, the caps that they have that are, you know, the lead reinforced caps, the glasses or goggles, uh, they have even gloves that some people use, and as well as the vests, the single piece and the two piece, which both, by the way, provide the same efficacy as far as radiation exposure when they put a dosimeter on the outside and on the inside of the vest. Uh, but usually the two-piece, uh, it's less somatic dysfunction and less pain that you get from that as far as back and neck pain because not all the weight is just all the way on. So just something else to consider. And having a thicker shielding, like usually it goes from 0.25 millimeters all the way to one. The thicker it is, there is a reduction in how much uh, radiation goes through and it is additive the number of shielding you have. So if you have a one of those body shields that it's like hard plastic reinforced with lead and then you have a vest on with a thyroid shield and you have a cap on and glasses studies have shown every all of that adds up and you get more uh diminishing of the radiation that you get exposed to also when it comes to modes uh, that i mentioned earlier you can have pulse mode which basically a uh, shorter amount of um, radiation uh that is being exposed and basically that's a lower quality image but it not you don't always necessarily need the highest quality image if you're already in the space you need and you're maybe advancing a little bit you just kind of need to see where it is generally so that's a good time to utilize that to expose yourself to less radiation and the patient uh, as well as low dose mode which is exactly what it sounds like you're just giving off less x-ray so once again lower quality image but less radiation exposure so when applicable be cognizant of using those as well. And collimation that I mentioned earlier is also something that it basically changes the how much the volume of X-ray and radiation that is coming out from the from the tube, the, the source. And sometimes that actually can improve your image based on like lateral lumbar, for instance, you can have a lot of uh, white from the table and sometimes it's better to kind of uh, get a smaller image that one, reduces the amount of radiation that's being exposed and two, you might actually get a higher quality image with less scatter as well. Um, next slide. Uh, and this is just a slide kind of talking about the units of measurements and what they use for the guidelines on the, on the next slide that I'll get to. And basically we're using milligrays now or grays, which is one one thousandth joule that's being uh, deposited per kg. So that's basically how much radiation is being deposited and absorbed in, in soft tissue. Uh, and then when it comes to uh, millisieverts, uh, that's basically the impact of that radiation clinically and the pathology that may result from that. And you can see that one uh, uh, milligray is equivalent to one millisievert. And the old units of the RAD and REM that you may see if you look at other studies or guidelines were formerly more popular and used before grays. And they're pretty much uh, same concept, but they're 10 times the value. So it takes 10 of milligrays or um, sieverts to get to that. Uh, next slide. And this is just kind of looking at uh, the, the graph or the table on your right kind of shows two of the organizations that kind of monitor and provide guidelines for radiation based on studies and what comes out as time goes on. The NCRP, the National Council of Radiation Protection, and the International Commission of uh, Radiological Protection as well. And they are always constantly changing how much you can be exposed to. And you can see they have them in REM and in parentheses, they have them in uh, millisieverts to kind of see how much they they recommend you get exposed to in those different body parts uh, annually. And sometimes they even have it cumulatively. Like if you look at the lens, they, they either have it 50 per year or 20 over five years because it is cumulative. And as you can see, they changed it from 2018 when it was 150 for the eye, but now it's come all the way down to 50 per year. So it just kind of shows you how there's more than we think and it's always important to protect yourself. 
And lastly, looking at the bullet points, you can actually see that an AP image and also lumbar imaging requires higher radiation doses and, and uh, shows, it express, exposes you to more radiation uh, compared to like a PA, which is like your standard chest X-ray you get in urgent care at a hospital or cervical uh, imaging, which is far less than AP, it's 10 times or more. So just something to keep in mind uh, when it comes to that. And it's important to also have a ways like dosimetry to kind of uh, follow it yourself. And a lot of pain docs do that, which you should, because these are just general guidelines and you can have the ring, uh, they have clips for your glasses. And of course the badge you can have on the outside, usually you can have it around your collar, just kind of be conservative with how much you're being exposed to versus on the inside of your vest. Um, and yeah, that's it, next slide. Thanks for that, Jason. Um, I'm gonna spend the next five to seven minutes going over the cervical spine anatomy, uh, as well as some of the angles that are commonly utilized um, and uh, some of the procedures. So when we look at the uh, anatomy of the cervical spine, it's uh, important to highlight that we have seven vertebral bodies and eight spinal nerves. As we all know, the spinal nerve gives rise to an anterior rami as well as a posterior rami. The posterior rami is what gives uh, rise to our medial branch nerve, which innervates our facet joints, which we commonly target during our interventional procedures. Uh, the medial branch nerves are uh, located along the articular pillars uh, in a pretty uniform fashion in the cervical spine in a predictable way. It's also, imp it's also important to uh, appreciate the relation of the vertebral uh, artery as it traverses through the transverse foramen, um, and this is anterior to the uh, facet column. Next slide, please. As with all of our interventional pain procedures, positioning is everything. Uh, in this slide, we see three different types of positioning that's utilized for the cervical spine. In the topmost pa uh, patient, we're seeing that the arms are flexed at the side and the hands are resting comfortably by the face. Um, the tilt that we see relative to the image intensifier, as Jason mentioned, is a uh, caudat tilt that is probably opening up the interlaminar windows for epidural access. On the bottom left, what we see is uh, my tech that is resting with his arms at his side instead of the you know, upper Superman position. And this position facilitates for visualizing the C71 junction a little bit better, especially in contralateral oblique fluoroscopy. On the bottom right, what we're seeing is positioning for a lateral medial branch block procedure. And in this picture, there is hyperextension of the neck, which is suboptimal. In an ideal world, the head should be elevated so it's neutral. Um, one can still do this procedure safely. However, you're gonna have a significant uh, cephalic tilt to your image intensifier. Next slide, please. On the far left, what we see is a epidural being performed in coaxial view uh, with, with entrance uh, at the left parasagittal C71 interspace. To appreciate that it's a true midline picture, we want the spinous processes aligned directly uh, to the midline and staring at us. On the left side, we see the lateral masses, which is the exact same thing as our facet column or our articular pillar. Um, they're all synonyms. And in the middle picture, what we're seeing is a contralateral oblique picture. So with the needle tip being left parasagittal, the middle image is showing a 45 degree angulation towards the right. And what you'll see is the lamina uh, that is clearly visualized at C7 as well as T1, and the needle is approaching that laminar line. It's not, visu it, it's not highlighted in this picture, we'll see that in the next slide, um, that the imaginary line between our lamina creates what's called the ventral interlaminar line. And that's a technique that Dr. Gill described in great detail that we'll cover soon. On the far right, we see a lateral fluoroscopy picture. And here, uh, what's highlighted is the J point. And the J point is the anterior aspect of the spinous process and the posterior aspect of the spinal canal. And it's at this juncture where you get the approximate boundary of the ligament flavum, uh, which we often are approaching for our loss of resistance technique. Next slide, please. So this is the paper uh, by Dr. Jitinder Gill that was published back in 2015 that I would highly, highly encourage everyone uh, familiarize themselves with it, um, if, if they haven't already read so. I think it was probably the biggest practice changing paper that I've read in the last uh, decade. And really what they do is uh, take uh, 
um, and describe using fluoroscopy as well as MRI and an AP that defines zones. So what you see on the bottom left is zone one, zone two, zone three, and zone X, which is far lateral into the gutter. When you are doing a contralateral oblique epidural placement, it's optimal to be in zone one and preferred to be parasagittal, whether it's a millimeter to the right or a millimeter to the left. Um, depending on where the needle entered the epidural space, as we all know, sometimes the needle can cross midline when advancing, but if it entered the epidural space on the left side, you want to oblique toward the right side. In this paper, they defined what 35 looks like, what 45 looks like, what 55 looks like, and it was found that 45 degree oblique often provides the most consistent and reliable picture. In the contralateral oblique view, in the middle, we see the ventral interlaminar line being formed, as well as the ventral foraminal line. And depending on where we accessed an AP view in zone one, two, or three, you're gonna find your needle in zone one, two, or three. And it can be quite unnerving to see the needle in the middle of the neural foramen in the cervical spine if you're not familiar with what's happening with these angles. On the far right, we see um, what's defined as the spinal laminar line, as well as the posterior articular uh, pillar line and the posterior vertebral line. And once again, I would say in a clinical sense, the most relevant tip is that before you engage your needle in the contralateral oblique view, always go back to AP to verify that we have not crossed midline. Because if you have crossed midline, you're gonna have to oblique the other way. Next slide, please. This is a picture of a cervical epidural injection that is not coaxial. We're using a long axis technique. Um, and here we see that the needle is approaching the lamina and being walked into the uh, interlaminar space. As we all know, epidurals are performed for radicular pains and radiculopathies. Um, since the needle entry is on the right side, the oblique picture that you see is 45 degrees toward the left. In the uh, red highlighter, we've highlighted the lamina and the line that it creates is that ventral interlaminar line. So kind of a look, going back to what Jason was saying earlier about radiation exposure, if you understand fluoroscopic anatomy, you will not engage your loss of resistance until your needle gets to the ventral interlaminar line. And that's where it's kind of clinically helpful. On the far right, we go to our lateral view where we see that J point once again being formed and we see a beautiful dorsal uh, contrast spread. Next slide, please. Here we have a medial branch block being performed in lateral. Both of these images are exactly the same. Uh, the purpose of this slide is just to show you the superimposition of the articular pillars on right and left. And this is a patient that's laying in lateral position uh, in the same uh, way that I had showed earlier with that with that tech. And what you're seeing is the yellow is the contralateral side that I'm working on and the red is the side that we're working on. So this is not a perfect lateral image, but as long as you understand what you're looking at, it's still safe to proceed with the procedure. In this case, it's a single needle technique for a medial branch that's being done. Um, first, it was advanced toward the C3 articular pillar, a local anesthetic was deposited, advanced north towards the C2, and then finally at the C4. Next slide, please. Lastly, what we see is uh, procedure uh, images of a cervical medial branch uh, radiofrequency ablation. Uh, this is performed after we have our successful diagnostic blocks uh, for facet-mediated pain. On the far left, we see an AP view. And what you're looking at is the needle advancing toward the articular pillar, where you, where you see the scalloping of the articular pillar is typically the level at which we're going to find our uh, pillar on lateral view. Um, in the middle, you're seeing a 15 degree ipsy lateral oblique, just showing the alignment of the uh, articular pillar. And lastly, on the far right, we are seeing a um, lateral image. Once again, this is not a perfect lateral, and this is intentionally shown on this. Um, as you can see that the articular pillars are not perfectly aligned. However, with this procedure, we utilize sensory and motor testing. Motor testing was performed, which was adequate, and lesioning was performed at this, um, at, you know, using this picture. Next slide, please, and I'll turn it over to Ryan. Perfect. Um, so next up, we're going to kind of discuss a little bit of thoracic vertebral anatomy. Um, as we all probably know, the thoracic vertebral spine essentially consists of 12 uh, individual thoracic vertebrae. 
Um, what's most notable in the thoracic region um, is both the angles and orientation are quite variable at each segment. Um, but we also know there's a variable course of the medial branches uh, in the thoracic spine. Um, so kind of with this being said, um, the optimal targets and the angles of entry are kind of going to depend on which specific thoracic vertebrae is going to be targeted at which specific le level. Um, a notable point is that the medial branches in the cephalad portion of the thoracic spine are located a bit more laterally over the transverse processes. And as you kind of descend within the thoracic spine, um, the medial branches course more medially closer towards that traditional transition zone between the superior articular process and the transverse processes um, that we're kind of a bit more familiar with in the lumbar spine. Um, so in general, it's, it's really important to assess which level you're working at within the thoracic spine and then kind of make adjustments according with the known variation um, in thoracic vertebral anatomy. Um, and then it's just to briefly review um, the nerve roots of the thoracic spine. They're gonna be named for the vertebral body, which they exit below. So I mean, the T1 nerve root will exit below the T1 vertebral body. And essentially there's 12 thoracic nerve roots, each ex exiting the neuroforamen below the 12 thoracic vertebral bodies. Next slide, please. Um, so the practical, practical application of this point is to really understand the angulation um, required at each particular thoracic level um, in regards to the C-arm uh, to kind of compensate for that cephalocaudal changes that we see. So in the up, upper thoracic spine, um, the spinous processes and interlaminar openings are a bit more perpendicular to the vertebral bodies, and that would require less cephalocaudal tilt as opposed to the lower thoracic segments, which are going to require a bit more um, cephalocaudal tilt. Um, and this orientation, in orientation um, above uh, that we can see here is probably best reflective of positioning required for a lower thoracic entry, um, just with that increase of low caudal tilt. Um, a brief but kind of clinical point here as well is that um, we're, we're very, t in the lumbar spine, we are commonly used to using a blanket or a pillow um, under the uh, um, lower abdomen to reduce some of that natural lumbar lordosis. Um, while we're in the thoracic spine, um, it's going to be important to, to uh, elevate or uh, more securely place the blanket more superiorly um, to reduce some of that uh, thoracic kyphosis that we can see. Next slide, please. Um, so to get started here, we have a, a basic thoracic interlaminar epidural um, injection um, in an AP view. Um, so kind of building upon those previously discussed principles and the variable anatomy of the thoracic spine, um, we'll kind of discuss what makes a good AP image. So as you can kind of see in the image to the left, we have uh, what well, we can see the end plates or the superior and inferior borders of the thoracic vertebral bodies are aligned, um, which is colloquially referred to as being squared off. And then we also see the spinous processes, which are midline with sharp, well-defining borders, all kind of indicating that this is a good AP image. Um, the annotation on the, on the image to the right kind of shows the pedicles, as you can see, the spinous processes, and then again, the inner laminar openings. Um, and then we can see the TUI needle here visualized, which is in that, again, that long axis view, which is kind of somewhat different than the coaxial approach, where the uh, TUI needle is kind of elongated and walked into the inner laminar space. Um, um, and then in, as well in this AP, we can also see some contrast spread throughout the lateral epidural space, kind of outlining some of the neuroforamen. Um, and then another important um, concept here with AP images within the thoracic spine is that they're often used for counting out levels, whether it be in the lumbar spine or within the thoracic spine. So you're, most commonly you'll see in, in clinical practice that 12th rib um, being used to identify T12 and then counting up or down from there. Um, and then it's just kind of important to note there is a certain subset of patients with a hypoplastic 12th rib, which can kind of, uh, you know, make the image look a little bit less clear than, than what we see above here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so commonly, kind of in the course of uh, a thoracic epidural, you're going to be obtaining a lateral film in the thoracic spine. Um, a true lateral film, like the, the one we see above, is going to show the leveled vertebral body end plates. You're going to see alignment of the rib shadows, which we can see kind of posteriorly or, or the left of the images above. Um, and then you're going to see nice circumferential neuroforamen. Um, in the image on the right, you can kind of see the vertebral bodies that are well-defined. And then you see the 2 e needle entering the posterior epidural space. And then you see some contrast in both the anterior and posterior epidural space. Um, so although we're commonly targeting the posterior epidural space, this is kind of a good visualization of that three-dimensional nature of the epidural space as contrast kind of spreads or coats around the entire epidural space. Um, and then just of note in the, the above images, you can as, as well see an air contrast level um, within the diaphragm. Next slide, please. 
So um, as we look at different targets, the thoracic spine, facet joints, and the medial branches, it's again kind of important to highlight the variable target location depending on the desired thoracic spinal level. Um, so the facet joint innervation is derived from the medial branches of the dorsal rami of the spinal nerves, as we kind of discussed earlier. And the facet joints receive innervation from two levels of spinal nerves. For example, the T4-5 facet joint is supplied by the medial branches originating from the T3 and T4 nerves, whereas the medial branches from the T3 nerve supplies the inferior articular process of the T4 vertebrae, and the medial branch of the T4 nerve supplies the superior articular process of the T5 vertebrae. So pa patients with facet-mediated pain or facet arthropathy are going to typically present in clinic with um, thoracic axial pain exacerbated with twisting, bending, extension, typically non-rating and non-radicular in nature. Um, so in the image above, you can kind of see the, the facet joints um, that is comprised of the superior and inferior articular processes. And then these commonly a target or commonly accepted target for the medial branches is that transition zone between the transverse process and the superior articular process. In the AP orientation in the, um, oops, sorry, in the AP orientation in the thoracic spine, the target needles are then kind of advanced in a coaxial fashion until the bone is contacted um, in, in, a, in that transition zone. Next slide, please. So um, again, uh, lateral views are traditionally utilized to confirm the depth of the needle placement and kind of further visualize those facet joints. Um, so you're, again, wanting to make sure you have a true lateral view if you're gonna be um, judging the depth of your needle. Um, and you can see the, the needles are advanced just to the facet joint line that's formed by both the superior and inferior articular processes. And then typically local anesthetics gonna be deposited at this location. Um, you want to make sure the needle tip is posterior to the joint lines here as well. Um, it's a bit uh, faint on the left image, but you can kind of see it highlight the, hi the highlighted needle tips on the right image. Next slide, please. So moving uh, inferiorly from the thoracic spine down to the lumbar spine, um, uh, this is probably a, a very common um, region to work for most interventional pain physicians. Um, a study published by the IASP in 2007 kind of looked at the global burden of low back pain as defined as pain in the area of the posterior aspect of the body from the lower margin of the 12th rib to the lower gluteal fold with or without pain referred down to one of the extremities. And they saw 7.5% of the global population currently met that criteria. Um, the lumbar spine consists of essentially five uh, individual lumbar vertebrae. The lumbar vertebrae have the largest bodies of the entire spine um, and an increase in this size as they descend. In, so as L5 and L4 are gonna be the largest within the lumbar spine. Um, and this is really a reflection of the responsibility of the lumbar spine as a load-bearing structure and a support system for the entire upper body. Um, but what makes a lumbar vertebrae? Um, typical lumbar vertebrae have distinct characteristics that kind of differ from both the thoracic and the cervical vertebrae. Um, it's going to be the presence of a large vertebral body, spinous processes that are short and thick um, relative to the size of the vertebrae, and that they project post perpendicularly and posterior from the body. Um, the articular facets are markedly vertical, and the superior facets are going to be directed posterior immediately. Um, the facets also have a unique feature of a curved articular surface um, that is one feature that really differentiates the lumbar spine facets from the thoracic spine. In addition, you're going to see mammillary processes on the posterior aspect of the superior articular process. Um, and there is one lumbar vertebrae that may be considered atypical, and that's, a, uh, that's sometimes L5 since it has such a large body. Um, and it has the largest transverse processes of all the vertebrae. Um, and the anterior aspect of L5 is known um, to have a greater height compared to the posterior aspect, and that's gonna kind of create that lumbosacral angle between the lumbar region and the sacrum. Next slide. Um, so it wouldn't make sense to talk about lumbar spine anatomy without commenting a bit on um, the epidural anatomy as well. Um, the epidural space contains fat, epidural veins, spinal nerve roots, and connective tissue. Um, to access the epidural space from a midline approach, you would typically traverse through both skin, subcutaneous tissue, supraspinous and interspinous ligaments, and into the ligament and flavum. Um, in a paramedium, paramedian interlaminar approach, you're typically going to skip the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments, and you'll, you'll advance like, directly to the ligament and flavum prior to reaching your epidural target. Um, the ligament and flavum plays a crucial role in epidural access, as it's often appreciated in, in both tactile feedback through the tui needle. Um, it's a dense homogeneous structure composed, composed of mostly of elastin, which connects the lamina of adjacent vertebrae. The lateral edges of the flavum surround facet joints anteriorly, kind of reinforcing their joint capsules. Um, and then when a needle is advanced towards the epidural space, there's that easily perceptible increase in resistance within the ligamentum flavum. And then more importantly, 
um, there's a perceptible sudden loss of resistance when the tip of the needle passes through the flavum and into the epidural space. Um, the ligamentum flavum consists of right and left halves that kind of join at an angle, uh, a little bit less than 90 degrees. And importantly, this midline fusion um, often has gaps. So there's a, they're absent to a variable degree within the flavum throughout the entire spine. Um, they're more common in the cervical and thoracic levels. There's a study by Yoon that basically showed uh, midline gaps between C3 and T2 occurred in roughly 87 to almost 100% of individuals. And the incidence of the midline gap decreased at lower vertebral levels down from T4 to T5 had the lowest within the thoracic region at about 8%. So in theory, this midline gap poses a risk of failure to recognize a loss of resistance, um, just kind of highlighting the importance of using fluoroscopy for a, a variety of interventional um, pain procedures. Um, that ligament is thinnest up in the cervical and upper thoracic regions and thickest in the lower thoracic and lumbar regions. Um, as a result, uh, again, the resistance to the needle advancements is going to be much more easily appreciated at the lower levels in the lumbar spine. Um, at the L2-3 interspace, the ligamentum is approx uh, approximately three to five millimeters thick. And then at that level, the distance from the ligament to the spinal meninges is roughly four to six millimeters. Um, of note, the spinal cord receives blood primarily from the anterior and two, one anterior and two posterior spinal arteries that are kind of derived from the vertebral arteries, as we kind of learned in basic anatomy. Um, we have a variety of other major arteries that kind of supplement the blood supply to the spinal cord, including the vertebral ascending of cervical arteries, posterior intercostals, the lumbar, and the lateral sacral arteries. Um, being that there's one single anterior spinal artery and two posterior arteries, and they both run longitudinally along the length of the cord. Um, and then they kind of combine with the segmental arteries at each level. Um, the major segmental artery of Adamkowitz, which is the largest segmental artery, um, it's found between T8 and L1 vertebral segments. Um, it's the major blood supplier to essentially two thirds of the spinal cord. So injury of this artery is gonna have a very um, common syndrome, which is called anterior spinal artery syndrome. Next slide, please. Like the thoracic spine, again, C-arm angulation is going to be required dependent on the specific lumbar level that you're going to be working at. So in general, it's important to remember to minimize lumbar lordosis via pillows and blankets uh, that serve as a bump. Um, and that's just going to be placed to the patient's lower ab abdomen. Next slide, please. <clears throat> One of the most common performed procedures um, kind of within the field of pain medicine is a lumbar epidural steroid injection. Um, it's commonly performed through an interlaminar approach. Kind of like the previous AP radiographs obtained, um, you see the vertebral bodies, end plates are squared off, the spinous processes are well aligned um, in, in a midline fashion. And you can kind of appreciate the inner laminar openings and the pedicles in this orientation um, as kind of described out there on the right. Um, we see the epidural needle entering there in a coaxial fashion through the inner laminar space. Um, and then in this view, we can also of note, appreciate the sacral foramina down the bottom of the image there and described on the right. Next slide, please. Um, so like uh, a previous epidural access, a lateral view um, would likely be obtained during a lumbar um, access. In the lateral view, again, we appreciate those squared off end plates, circumferential narrow foramen. Um, we can also see the tween needle here entering posterior to the epidural space, just inferior to the L5 spinous process at that L5 S1 inner laminar opening. Um, we see the spinal laminar line on the right side, which is in red, um, which is, corresponds to the approximate location of the posterior margin of the spinal canal. Uh, most commonly, the twin needle is going to be advanced direct in a, in a direct close proximity to this line or this radiographic landmark, and then you're going to use a loss of resistance technique um, to identify the epidural space. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, this is just an image that kind of uh, portrays the lumbar spine epidurogram in both an AP and lateral view. Um, typically, we're going to use radio contrast to confirm needle location within the epidural space. And you can just kind of here see uh, that in the AP orientation, you can visualize the contrast spreading out to the lateral borders of the epidural space through the neuroframen and kind of surrounding the spinal nerves. Um, of note, if there is a specific neuroframen that is severely stenotic or um, obstructed, you may have an absence of contrast spread throughout that corresponding nerve root. In the lateral view, um, we can again see the contrast in both the anterior and the posterior epidural space, which kind of further solidifies this three-dimensional nature of the epidural space. Next slide, please. So in the above images we looked at, they showed optimum anatomy of the lumbar spine. Um, as we all know, uh, pain conditions don't exist in isolation, and either for the more it's likely that we're going to encounter suboptimal images during the treatment of chronic low back pain. Um, so this is some images. These are some images here um, that show a patient that suffered from lumbar spinal stenosis with neurogenic clonication, 
They were treated with an indirect lumbar decompression with a series of two inner spinous spacer devices. Um, and the existence of these devices prevents a traditional coaxial approach to the epidural space. So here we see the, the two needles advanced in a parasagittal fashion in this long, ass, long axis view. Um, and the paired contralateral oblique and lateral views kind of confirm the tip in, within the epidural space um, with contrast in the posterior epidural, for our epidural space. Um, and then of note, the lateral view is as well not optimized, but as long as you can appreciate um, the, uh, the, your, as long as you can appreciate um, the images that you do obtain, um, we can see the vertebral body in the yellow and the, the needle safely located within the, epidural, the posterior epidural space. Um, I think this, this series of images here really highlights the importance of utilization of multiple views um, to uh, require to attempt when you're attempting access in, in difficult patients or challenging anatomy. And it really understands on, to have a uh, strong understanding of how anatomy plays a role. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that, next we'll discuss a little bit about transforaminal epidural injections. Um, the spinal nerves kind of increase in size as the spinal cord descends. However, the intervertebral foramen decrease in size. So this combination, in addition to pathology such as intervertebral disc degeneration, brings two adjacent vertebral bodies closer together, commonly leads to spinal stenosis and, and vertebral foramen compression of the spinal nerves. Um, the transforaminal epidural access is obtained for via a percutaneous te technique, um, where the epidural space is accessed through the neuroframen from a lateral to medial orientation. Um, transforaminal injections have this theorized benefit of depositing the maximal amount of injectate to the direct symptomatic level, the idea of maximizing the effect of said injectate. Um, there are essentially two theoretical targets or safe zones, or, or target zones for transforaminal epidural access. Um, in the traditional safe zone, which is the anterior superior quadrant, in the AP view, we see that it's located in the superior part of the foramen. Um, this is the image off to the left. Um, in the lateral view, although it's not really pictured above, it would be the anterior part of the foramen. Um, this means a needle target in the superior anterior quadrant of the neuroframen is the goal. Um, however, in this quadrant, um, as it was typically deemed the safe triangle, it's actually the most common location of the anterior segmental artery. Um, and so this term safe is often a bit of a misnomer. Um, because it was originally thought to keep away from the nerve root, or although it's the highest likelihood of, of an intravascular injection. This Cambin triangle, uh, which is the posterior inferior quadrant, um, in the AP view, you're gonna see the triangle within the inferior part of the foramen. Um, and then in a lateral view, this would be located in the posterior part of the foramen, um, is unlikely to have uh, intravascular induction as it's the least likely to have the, uh, any anterior segmental arteries located. Next slide, please. So to perform a transferamal epidural steroid injection, it's gonna be performed typically in an ipsilateral oblique or a Scotty dog view. Um, just to basically describe this the Scotty dog view, it's the transverse process creates the nose, the pedicle forms the eyes, inferior articular facet is the front leg and the superior articular facet represents the ear. And then the pars interarticularis or the portion of the lamina that lies between the facets would be equivalent to the neck of the dog. So after obtaining an ipsilateral oblique view, you can visualize the needle advance inferior to the pedicle to the target in a coaxial fashion. Radio contrast is utilized to confirm placement. And then in an AP film, the contrast is seen outlining the nerve root, moving medial to the lateral aspect of the epidural space. Um, although unlikely, it is important to note that it's still possible to get a dural puncture with a transferable technique. Next slide, please. So the first image here shows a contrast within the central aspect of the epidural space, again, with that posterior and anterior spread of contrast. The second image kind of outlines the nerve root within the proximal epidural spread. So you see it moving from the nerve root into the central epidural space. And then the final image is, is the utilization of digital subtraction imaging, which is uh, theorized to assist in identification of vascular uptake of contrast. Um, but you can see the contrast here spreading throughout the nerve root. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so there's a, um, a uh, case uh, or a series of uh, recommendations done um, and the form of consensus points that were um, analyzed by consensus working group to kind of create a safe procedural guidelines to improve safety profiles for both transforaminals and, and traditional interlaminar epidural steroid injections. They involve some general um, clinical considerations, which involved the use of image guided views, the injection of contrast under real time fluoroscopy, review of prior imaging studies, use of face mask and sterile gloves, use of extension tubing, and the avoidance of heavy sedation. Next slide. But then they had a, a series of um, specific points of view that I think are just worth briefly iterating. Um, so cervical epidural steroids are in, associated with a rare risk of catastrophic neurologic injury, 
Um, transforaminal epidural steroids using particulate steroid are also associated with a rare risk of catastrophic neurovascular complications. Um, so all cervical epidural steroid injections should be performed using image guidance with appropriate AP, lateral, or contralateral obliques and a test dose of contrast medium. Cervical epidural steroids are recommended to be performed at C7-T1, but prefer preferably not higher than the C6-C7 level. No cervical epidural steroid injections um, should be undertaken at any segmental level without reviewing before the procedure prior imaging studies that show there's adequate epidural space for needle placement. Particulate steroids should not be used in therapeutic cervical transforaminal injections. All lumbar epidural steroid injections should be performed using image guidance with appropriate AP lateral and contralateral oblique abuse. And then lumbar transforaminal injections should be performed by injecting contrast medium under real-time fluoroscopy. Um, there's a, in, within transforaminals, it's also recommended that a non-particulate steroid, uh, i.e. dexamethasone, should be used for the initial injection within the lumbar transforaminal um, epidural space. Um, there would be situations where particulate could be useful, um, but should be performed after um, using um, uh, non-particulate steroid injections. Um, next slide, please. Um, so like the thoracic spine, the lumbar facet joints are created from the superior and inferior articular processes. There's a study done by Atsuka and group that looked at the biological aging process of lumbar facet joints and established kind of some several principles in the common course of aging by in vivo MRI measurements. Um, the facet joint surface area increases as you descend within the inferior spinal level. So notably the lumbar facet joint surface area increases with age. Um, and this was most notably over the age of 40. So patients and within patients that endorsed history of chronic low back pain. So those are, there's this theorized idea of larger lumbar facet joint surface area was a correlation to, to pain. Um, again, as we know, each facet joint is innervated by two medial branches. Um, so for example, the L4-5 facet joint innervated by both the L3 and L4 spinal nerves. Um, so for lumbar intraarticular facet joint injections, um, they have some, they have provide mobility to the lumbar spine. Um, so to perform an injection, again, we're gonna obtain that ipsilateral oblique view, and we're gonna appreciate the facet joint line near the posterior aspect of the ear of the Scotty dog. Using a coaxial approach, a needle is gonna be introduced into the facet joint space as seen on that image to the left. Um, the facet joints have a variable anatomy, but um, uh, multiple studies have indicated that the theoretical volume capacity of the lumbar facet joints is somewhere between one to two milliliters. Next slide, please. Um, so the medial branches are another popular target for treatment of facetogenic pain in the, in the lumbar spine. Um, as we kind of alluded to earlier, the medial branch location within the lumbar spine is a bit more consistent, most commonly seen at that transition of the superior articular process and the transverse process. Next slide. So to perform a, um, sorry, next slide. Um, to perform a uh, lumbar medial branch block, um, a ipsilateral oblique view would be obtained. We're going to identify that target site just above the transverse process and superior articular process um, junction. Um, we're going to exercise with local anesthetic, insert the needle, and advance in a coaxial fashion until you contact us at that target location. Um, there's a variety of techniques. There's um, a one skin insertion to the site, as Dr. Amon referred to above, um, where your one entry site and the, the, the needle can be walked to multiple levels as opposed to multiple targets, uh, entry sites like the, the image displayed here above. Um, studies have shown increase in the efficacy with the use of contrast and improved outcomes and efficacy um, for block uh, and the decreased risk of intravascular injection. injection. Next slide, please. During the course of this uh, lumbar medial branch block, we a lateral view can also be obtained. Um, it's important, to, again, to confirm that needle tip is located posteriorly to the facet joint line and away from the neuroframen. So of note, as we kind of target the lower lumbar vertebrae, the shadow of the iliac crest can begin to kind of obscure the lateral images a bit. Um, just something to be mindful when you're targeting specifically that L5 vertebrae. Next slide. So the sacral iliac joint is among the most common sources of chronic low back pain. Some studies put it at somewhere between 15 to 30% of patients coming in with chronic low back pain. It's got a pretty complex anatomic structure, nerve innervation, and functional biomechaniz biomechanisms um, that kind of make it challenging sometimes to diagnose and treat SI joint pain. Um, in addition to physical therapy and medications for treating SI joint pain, there's a multiple multitude of interventional procedures, including steroid injections, radiofrequency ablation, prolotherapy, and SI joint fusion that have been all been proposed with a, a variety of efficacies. Um, but the SI joint of note is the largest true synovial joint in the body. 
Um, although there's significant variability between individuals regarding its shape and size, the surface area of the SI joint is approximately 17.5 centimeters squared, and the, the volume of the joint is around 0.6 to 2.5 milliliters, something to just keep in mind when you're considering the volume of injectate you'd be putting into the SI joint. Um, it's got a synovial cleft that kind of narrows with age. So in young patients, you're going to see it at around 1.1 to 2 millimeters. And then as adults age, it's going to be around 0 to 1 millimeters. Um, the existing literature has kind of established that the innervation of the SI joint is relatively variable. Um, they have pointed out that... Um, that, or it's a study by Fortin that showed that um, the posterior joint and ligaments mainly receive their innervation from the S1 to S3 dorsal rami and some contribution from L5. Um, and that a variety of controlled studies really reported that marked and prolonged efficacy of L5 dorsal rami and lateral branch blocks of S1, S3 um, can help with chronic SI joint pain. Um, so sacroiliac joint injections are typically reformed after obtaining an AP view with some contralateral oblique to account for that natural alignment of the SI joint. Um, and then the needle is going to be advanced in a coaxial fashion, as you can kind of see here on the left. Um, and then needle placements confirm with some contrast. And you can see the arthrogram as the die spreads from inferior to superior. Um, next slide. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I'm going to spend the next eight to 10 minutes going over a um, couple of neuromodulation procedures that are commonly utilized. Uh, now that we've covered anatomy of the cervical spine, anatomy of the thoracic spine, we can take a little bit of a deeper dive into these procedures. Uh, spinal cord stimulation is often performed for a complex regional pain syndrome of the upper extremity or the lower extremity, um, as well as for post-laminectomy uh, syndrome. Uh, during this procedure, uh, what we can see here is on the left side, the needle is advanced in a right parasagittal fashion uh, toward the T2, T3 interlaminar uh, epidural space. Um, with the needle uh, initially touching this lamina here, um, the needle is slipped off toward the interlaminar space, and then a contralateral oblique image is taken to uh, gauge depth of the needle, which is currently not done in AP view. Um, once we get the needle to the ventral interlaminar line, loss resistance is performed. Uh, here on the right side, we're seeing um, an AP projection of the leads in uh, place. Uh, the left lead is quite midline, and the right lead is a little bit right parasagittal. In this patient's case, she had CRPS of the upper extremity. Moving on to the next slide, um, here is a picture on the left side, once again, showing that ventral interlaminar line after which we would expect the epidural space to be. So that needle during the case is advanced all the way to the lamina. Once we get to the lamina, then contrast and loss of resistance is utilized to uh, get epidural access. In a lateral projection, when uh, considering spinal cord stimulation procedures, we wanna be in the dorsal epidural space. So the dorsal epidural space is right adjacent to the uh, spinous processes. If these leads were projecting along the um, posterior border of the vertebral body, that would be anterior placement, uh, which is suboptimal and would result in motor activation and not activation of the, uh, the dorsal horns. <clears throat> now, one thing I forgot to mention is that in the previous slide, the reason we uh, often access in the thoracic spine is, as Ryan alluded to, the thickening of the ligamentum flavum. In the cervical spine, the ligamentum flavum um, is approximately 2.4 millimeters and at the C7, T1 junction uh, goes to 3.16 and the thoracic spine goes to about 3.2, 3.3 millimeters. So it's a commonly utilized site. Um, here, what we're seeing is placement for a thoracic uh, spinal cord stimulator device. This is often utilized for, once again, CRPS, post-laminectomy syndrome, lumbar reticulitis. And in this picture on the left side, we're seeing an AP projection. As Ryan uh, pointed out, the spinous processes should be nice and midline. The vertebral end plate should be squared off. And the needle is introduced along the skin um, in a left parasagittal fashion in this picture toward the lamina. Once on the lamina, it is slipped off the lamina. And once again, either contralateral oblique or lateral fulloscopy, whichever one you're more comfortable with, uh, before you engage loss of resistance technique to get epidural access. 
on the right side, we're seeing the uh, placement of the thoracic leads along the T7, T8 disc space and T8, T9 disc space, which are commonly utilized targets. Um, the lead locations is beyond the scope of today's presentation, um, but oftentimes is based upon paresthesia mapping um, that was done by John Carlo Barilot, uh in the early 90s. <clears throat> when we think about our spinal cord stimulator placement on lateral view, what we're looking at on the left side is the lamina. We can see the clear laminar line, the ventral interlaminar line, the needles are just past that ventral interlaminar line and the leads are being advanced cephalad. This is a patient with a anterior posterior fusion um, and has a stimulator for um, persistent post-surgical pain. In the lateral view, we're seeing that the ribs are not perfectly aligned. But once again, it's important to appreciate all the fundamentals of fluoroscopic anatomy and then consider what it's being utilized for. So in this particular case, the reason a lateral image is taken to ensure that the leads are dorsal. And when we think of dorsal lead placement, here is our neural foramen, and we wanna be on the posterior side of the neural foramen and not the anterior side of the neural foramen. If we're on the anterior side of the neural foramen, we will not be able to activate the dorsal columns and once again, get motor stimulation. This is, a picture, this is a depiction of a uh, dorsal root ganglion spinal cord stimulator system. This is often utilized to target, um, once again, CRPS um, that, or, or even mononeuropathies, post, persistent post-surgical pain that is more focal um, as the DRG is, um, has the ability to um, activate or suppress propagation of nociceptive stimuli at very low energy levels, very low amplitude. There's less CSF around the DRG. It's subperception uh, with a primary cell battery. And what we're looking at is what we want to do is ideally try to square off the inferior end plate when doing DRG placement. Um, this is not a perfectly squared off end plate. And once again, it's being showed with intent to show that this is not a perfectly squared off. This is a better squared off L5 superior end plate. Uh, for DRG placement, we often utilize a anterograde approach um, for the L4, L5 levels where the needle is passed in a uh, parasagittal fashion, uh, contralateral to the target DRG. So the right side L4, L5 placement is being performed with the uh, leads being introduced under the pedicle where the DRG is known to live. When we go to our lateral projection, um, for DRG lead placement to be adequate, um, it, it must be posterior to this vertebral body margin. Um, because once again, we're targeting a different structure. We're not targeting the dorsal columns. So the DRG is passing through the neural foramen. So as long as my lead is somewhere in this vicinity, that is considered a good placement. Looking at the next slide, um, here we see the sacral foramina. Uh, when we place DRG, um, on label placement is T10 to S2. S1, S2 are often utilized um, for either pelvic pain or radicular leg pain. Um, and the neural foramen um, is, is, is located right over here where the pointer is. When we place our DRG needle, there's different ways of placing it along the sacral uh, foramen. There's not just one way. Um, here you see coaxial placement, uh, kind of that gun barrel view that we often describe in pain. Um, and in lateral view, the lead is passed through the sacral foramina uh, with three leads into the canal and one lead just past the canal. And that's done with intent because there's cadaveric studies that show 40 to 50% of the patients, the DRG is in the canal and um, in 40 to 50% it's in the foramen. Lastly, we'll jump into some uh, commonly seen pathology. This is a uh, depiction of Bertolotti syndrome. Um, the incidence of Bertolotti syndrome is somewhere around 4.6, 4.7% based on MRI studies. And essentially it is a pseudo articulation of the transverse process um, to the sacrum as well as the iliac crest. And this can often result in low back pain. This can result in accelerated disc degeneration along adjacent segments, including your L5, S1, as well as your L4, L5. Um, oftentimes people will do corticosteroid injections into the pseudo articulating joints 
or sometimes you can treat it using uh, medial branch blocks and radio frequency ablation. A PARS defect. Um, another word for a PARS defect that we often utilize is spondylolysis. Um, and essentially, what is the PARS? The PARS interreticularis is this bone here. Um, it has poor blood supply. And really what it does is it connects the superior facet to the inferior facet. Um, and when we often uh, see the Scotty dog, the in the Scotty dog, this part right here, as well as the tail here is the superior articular processes. Both of the feet are the inferior articular processes. And um, the eye of the Scotty dog or the nose is the pedicle and uh, the PARS is right over here. So when we have a PARS defect, that often results in what's called isthmic spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis is when we have slippage of the vertebral column, um, where one vertebral segment translates forward or backward in relation. So here we have your um, L4 relative to L5 slipping forward. It's an anterolisthesis. Um, and in the circle is what we've shown is the PARS defect. So this is a case of uh, isthmic spondylolisthesis. Um, it's categorized or subcategorized in grades. So grade one, grade two, so grade one is typically less than 25% slip, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, and grade four is um, greater than 75% um, movement in, in, in this portion. The causes for uh, spondylolisthesis can be a multitude. You can have degenerative spondylolisthesis, you can have traumatic spondylolisthesis. Um, in some patients, it can be post-surgical. In some patients, it can be pathologic uh, due to a uh, malignancy, or the most common is probably ismic due to a PARS defect. And this will typically present in patients as back pain uh, or uh, radiculopathy. So when we have a patient with spondylolisthesis, what we want to do is perform flexion extension imaging. On the far left, what you see is a neutral film, a flexion film, and an extension film. And in this patient, you can see a pretty clear slip. It's a grade two slip. Um, but what's interesting is that it's not really moving in flexion or extension. So it's not unstable. Dynamic instability is defined as if there's greater than three millimeters of movement between flexion and extension, or greater than 10 degrees of translocation. So in this patient's case, it's not unstable. If it's dynamic instability, they typically need a front back fusion. Um, lastly, we're going to just see an example of uh, variant anatomy. Uh, here's a patient with four vertebral bodies, and here's a patient with six vertebral bodies. So once again, always important to compare to MRI and count our levels appropriately. I believe that is all we have. Thank you. You're muted, Tim. Thank you, everyone. I want to thank our uh, panelists, Dr. Aman, Dr. Kuda, and Dr. Esla for uh, excellent presentation. We have some questions, but before uh, we get into the questions, I want to just uh, highlight some of the upcoming um, lectures and uh, presentations that are going to be uh, in the very near future. On October 25th, Aspen will host the second in this uh, series of fellows webinar. This particular one will be focusing on lumbar MRI, understanding the basics to facilitate interpretation. And then there's some other educational uh, opportunities that are available. Uh, next slide, there is the um, Aspen um, meeting in the uh, second week of um, December, I believe, and then the um, upcoming annual meeting of Aspen in summer of 2023. So you can hold those uh, dates. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the questions that have been asked here, I'd like to throw the first one out to Dr. Aman. Uh, the questioner asks, is it uh, make a difference if you enter the or advance the epidural needle into the epidural space in any particular uh, fashion, such as bevel up or bevel down, or theoretically bevel uh, pointing to the side? Uh, do you have a preference? What do you think some of the issues are regarding that, uh, Dr. Ahmad? That's, that's a great question, uh, and I'll keep it very brief. 
Uh, in short, there's been a lot of uh, studies that have looked at this very question, and yes, it does make a difference for the most part. The TUI needle has a slight bevel to it, slight curve to it. So if you have it facing toward the head, typically the uh, softer part of the curve is exposed to the dura. If you have it uh, facing toward the feet or caudad, it's the sharp beveled edge that's facing the dura. So you have a higher risk of real tear. And the second consideration would be um, if you're wanting to advance a catheter for any reason, uh, the bevel of the needle will uh, affect which way your catheter goes. I can tell you another um, key point that I was uh, trained in uh, many decades ago, and so this is uh, really old school training, is that once you entered your needle in the epidural space, you didn't want to rotate it, either cephalate or caudate, because it could theoretically increase the risk of a subdural or potentially a subarachnoid injection. Uh, another question I want to throw out to uh, Dr. Kuda, how would you describe the differences that you look for to differentiate whether or not your needle is epidural versus subarachnoid or intrathecal when you inject your radiocontrast? So I think here in the lateral, uh, if you can kind of remember the lateral image is uh, both the um, thoracic and lumbar spine. As we saw the contrast in, in a discrete line posteriorly in the film, kind of hugging the um, that spinal lamina, laminar ligament, you kind of saw the uh, contrast spreading in that fashion. If you were to be subarachnoid in that point, you would see a more um, layering spread of contrast as it, as it filled the entire um, spinal canal. Um, and then you may see some uh, increased contrast spread in a cephalocaudal direction a bit more rapidly upon um, injection and visual, visualization with live fluoroscopy. And then uh, once again, uh, Dr. Oman, a questioner asks, what's the optimal angle for the contralateral oblique when you're performing surgical epidural steroid injections? Could you review that one um, manuscript from uh, pain medicine that we mentioned earlier? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so Dr. Jatinder Gill is the one that published that paper in 2015, and the answer is 45 degrees um, based on his findings. And if you look at that paper, they really describe the differences at 35, 45, 55, and so forth. Uh, what I will say is I use the contralateral oblique technique in the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. When it's being utilized in the lumbar spine, it's important to um, appreciate your patient concerns. So in some of our older patients that have scoliosis, you know, those angles change completely. All right. And then um, lastly, Dr. Esla, is there any particular um, textbook or treatise or um, manuscript that you read that helped you uh, prepare uh, for uh, tonight's uh, presentation? Uh, yeah, actually, a lot of it was uh, on the CDC website with the Alara recommendations. They actually have them on there, and they have a lot of references you can uh, go to from there that kind of, you know, provided guidance to kind of find different studies that I, I looked at um, for the information I found. All right. Well, I would like to thank everyone who uh, participated, and uh, most of all, thank all our uh, 150 some odd uh, people who uh, listened in to our presentation and we look forward to having you back again for our next uh, presentation here, the second in this series on October 25th. And then we will plan to have a third one in November as well. Good night, everyone.